Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Taunton campus. Uh, my name is Eva Brito, and I am the director of the um, Bristol Community College Women's Center. And we're very excited this morning to have our stories that inspire here at the Taunton campus for our first one, and we hope to have many more here at our Taunton campus. So thank you, uh, Dean Resendiz, for hosting us. So I'm going to share a little bit about the Women's Center, for those that don't know, and then we'll go into our stories that inspire feature. So we're very fortunate to have a Women's Center as part of Bristol Community College. We're actually one in three community college that have a Women's Center. And the Women's Center is a space where students can feel safe and supported. And despite the name, it's all students. So regardless of how you identify, you have a space at the Women's Center. And we're actually located, our physical space is located in the Fall River campus in the E building, E104A. So if you're ever on that campus, please come and check us out. We have a beautiful space there, very new, renovated, and we're a fairly new center as well. And the, the center is a space where students can feel safe and supported, as I said, and really have authentic conversations about the inequities that exist within the genders and to provide educational and resources so students can feel supported. Part of my background is I'm a licensed social worker, so I can definitely support you in finding resources and some of the issues that you may face or someone that you care about face. I'll share a little bit about what's actually inside the space. Uh, we have at the center a lactation room for students that are um, nursing. So do we have any parents in the room? Parents? Okay, great. So I want to put a plug in that we also have a parenting club here at the college. How many folks know that we had a parenting club? Okay, so we have a parenting club, and that's one of the missions of the Women's Center to really support our parenting students, part of our population, a big part, our students that are parents and are juggling school, juggling life, juggling children. How do we best support you? We're actually going to have a meeting this Friday, uh, the Friday the 6th at 6 p.m. at the Women's Center in Fall River. But if you feel like, you know, Fall River's too far away, Eva, I wanted the supports here in Taunton. If we get a group together, we'll also have a meeting here at the Taunton campus. So don't feel like it's exclusive only to Fall River. Uh, we have a, within the Women's Center, a lot of different resources as well. We have a resource table there. We have a study area. And we also have a professional closet. So if you get to Fall River, we have clothing there for all genders. We have some men's suits. We have some accessories, some purses. And our goal for the next semester is to do a Dress for Success event. So that's going to be coming up in April. But if you are having an interview or some sort of professional event and may not have the clothing, don't want to spend the money, you can go there, get the clothes, all donated, very lightly used, some brand new items that you can use as well. We also have a great resource there of books, a lending library. So for instance, if you have to do a paper on some issue that relates to women, I bet you can find a book there that can support you in that. So we have a lot to offer. Actually, we have an exciting week today. We have our program that we'll go into in a minute. But tomorrow at 12 o'clock, we have what we do, a lunch and learn series, which I hope to do one here in the campus center um, at the Taunton Center as well. And it's an opportunity to do just some mingling and getting to know other folks in a fight, fun, light environment. And it's going to be with essential oils. So tomorrow at 12 uh, to 2, someone's going to come in and share about how essential oils can support your wellness, your wellness, <laughs> your wellness, <laughs> and <laughs> hope um, that that could help you. And we're going to have a nurse practitioner be part of that and show you that information. But today, uh, we're here for Stories That Inspire series. Every month, we have a speaker that comes in and shares their story. And we feel that there's power in a story. Hopefully, you can connect to someone's story and feel inspired. And we're very glad to have State Representative Shauna O'Connell as our Stories That Inspire today. She has been a state rep since 2011 and is now the newly elected mayor of Taunton, the first female mayor. So we're very glad to share um, with her, and thank you for coming. So let's give a hand for Shauna. Hi. One second. I just want to say there is a sign-in sheet coming around. If you could please sign in. So, 
And so good, good morning. So is it okay to keep this right here? Okay, great, great, great. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. I'm really thrilled to be here this morning. As I was talking to a few of the other students, I actually have been taking classes at BCC myself. Um, so I'm kind of right there with you. I took a couple of semesters off because I've been really busy lately, um, but, uh, but I will get back into it. Um, but I'm really excited to kind of be here this morning to share with you my path in life, I guess, that led me to where I am today. So I'll just start at the beginning. Uh, when I was a young child, um, my parents divorced, and I was about seven or eight years old, so of course that was a, a difficult time for my family. Um, I have a, an older brother and an older sister, and we eventually moved into low-income housing, uh, subsidized housing, with my mom uh, and my brother and my sister when I was about 10 years old. And that was a real change for me from the kind of quiet, dead-end street neighborhood that I grew up on. I saw you know, things that I really hadn't been exposed to before. It was really a different kind of lifestyle, no more kind of playing kick the can and hide and seek and all those fun things we did as a kid. It was a little bit of um, grow up really fast and learn some, some different ways of life. So even though you know things really changed for me, um, I was always uh, a good student, always really cared a lot about school and my grades, always wanted to get those straight A's and was really disappointed if I didn't. Uh, I would, you know, the night before a test, even when I was in, you know, fourth or fifth grade, I would be so nervous. I would be thinking, oh, I didn't study hard enough or I don't know what I'm, you know, what the questions are going to be and I'd be in tears. And my fourth grade teacher knew that and before a test she would bring me up to her desk and say, Shauna, are you okay? Do you need anything? And that really helped me through school. It really showed me how much you know, your teachers care about you and your success and helped me get through those tough times. So I, I will never forget my fourth grade teacher, Mrs. Peterson, uh, who actually called me uh, recently after I, I won this election to congratulate me. So that was really cool to have my fourth grade teacher call me up and uh, talk to me about that. Um, so going along through taught in public schools, uh, I got to high school, obviously, and you know, by the time I got to high school, I was not really as engaged in school as I would have liked to have been. No more you know, teams. I didn't participate in after-school activities or sports. When I was 14, I started working as much as I could because we really didn't have a lot of money. And if I ever wanted anything, I had to earn some money to get it. So that was kind of more important to me at that time. And you know, I'll, I'll tell you, I do kind of regret in high school not being into the high school scene and you know the yearbook committee or you know, cheerleading or whatever it was that you could be involved in. I feel like I missed out on a lot of that because I did want to work all the time or you know hang out with my friends and do other things. Um, and I remember, you know, and this is kind of a strange thing to remember, but you know, because we didn't have a lot of money and I wanted to earn money, it was, it, we struggled for just you know, simple things in life. One year for Christmas, our Christmas tree stand broke, and I remember having to ask somebody you know, if we could borrow one. It wasn't like we would just go out and buy something like that, like you would nowadays. You know, when, you know, at that same time, I, I had to dress up to go somewhere, and I needed a pair of nylons, right? A pair of nylons. You need a pair of nylons, you just go out to the store and buy them. But I had to call my cousin and ask her if I could borrow a pair because I just couldn't go out and buy any at that time. So that really gives me now, looking back, an appreciation for things and for, for things that you have, an appreciation for the struggles that, that people face in life. I, I can understand that. I, I've been there and I've done that. So at 14, I would work you know, in, um, you know, for mall vendors, at flea markets, babysitting. I was lucky enough to be eligible for the summer work program for low-income kids where I could get a job, and I got a job at the local DPW. Um, probably I, I learned some, some choice words there, but, <laughs> but they, were, they were really great people, though, that worked there, and I also learned how much the people that work in our city care about our city and care about our jobs. 
So that kind of gave me a nice connection to my community, even at a young age. And I would also work for uh, a woman who was in a wheelchair. And I was kind of like a little bit like her aide. And that was when I was about 14 years old. And that was really another great experience in my life because it made me understand the struggles that other people in different situations face and have a real appreciation for uh, people who have uh, physical or intellectual challenges. Um, and they, they do have challenges because they're not treated the same. I went with her on trips, so we went to the airport once, and she's in the wheelchair, and I'm standing next to her, and the person at the desk, when we were checking in for our tickets, looked at me and said, can she walk? And I'm thinking, she's right there. Why don't you ask her? And you know, my friend said, I can walk. I mean, I can talk. I just can't walk. And that always stuck with me, that we really need to treat everyone with respect um, that they deserve, no matter what situation they're in in life. So I feel I like I had a lot of these great learning experiences along the way in life, even though I also faced a lot of challenges. Um, one great thing that my parents, my mom and my dad instilled in me that I will always be thankful for is a good work ethic. You know, I would always have two jobs if I had to, um, do whatever I had to make money. And so when I was about 16 or 17 uh, in high school, I actually quit high school. And I, and I didn't realize many of you are in the high set program. So at that time, I, I quit high school because I wanted to just work and you know, contribute to the household and have money for myself. And, but I went immediately and got my GED at that time. It was a different kind of program. But I knew if I didn't do it right away, I would probably never do it. So I went and got my GD, GED before my class even graduated. And I, you know, I'm, I'm so glad that I did that. Um, but I went into full-time jobs, and one of my jobs was working at a box factory in Taunton. I think it was called the Mason Box Factory. And I hated that job. <laughs> you know, I thought, boy, I cannot do this for the rest of my life. And I went to other jobs. I worked at um, a local nursing home in the food service department. And I was pretty quickly moved into a supervisory position. I was still a teenager at this time. And then I went and got a job at Morton Hospital where they hired me as a supervisor in the food service department. And so again, I bring that back to kind of the work ethic that my parents instilled in me. And so when I was about, I think, maybe 19 or so, 18 or 19, my dad uh, called me up and he said, listen, you got to do something. And I just signed you up at Massasoit Community College. I paid for your first semester. You know, go register. And I was like, OK, I guess that's what I'm going to do. Because if you know my dad, you know, he threw pennies around like manhole covers. <laughs> so for him to go and pay for my first semester was really a big deal. And hopefully he's not going to watch this. Uh, <laughs> but you know, he, he always did stick with us. But he really instilled in us um, self-sufficiency and self-reliance. You know, my parents just didn't give us everything. Uh, so I started at Massasoit Community College um, when I was about 19 or so and went for a year and then decided to take time off, which again was not a good choice <laughs> once you decide to take time off from school. It makes it difficult to get back there. But I took some time off, I worked again full time, and I did go back again and I went into the court reporting program. Now, a court reporter is a court stenographer. You might see them on TV sometimes with their little machines. They're doing this. Um, and it's much different than you see on TV, I'll tell you that. Uh, but you know, I, it took me a while, but I eventually graduated. I ended up transferring to Mass Bay College and graduated from there. 
But that was a program that was a really, really difficult program to get through. The dropout rate for that program was extremely high. The graduation rate was extremely low um, because it was very intense. And you know, in addition to your academic classes, of you know your legal classes, medical classes, uh, heavy, heavy concentration on ELA, it was also a skill. So you had to build up your speed. Um, and to graduate, you had to ha be able to type at 225 words a minute. So when you see on TV them leisurely going like this, uh, you're, you're, you're like banging away. It's, it's really intense. You've got to be fast. And there were so many times during my time in college that I just wanted to quit because it was just so hard, so difficult. It took so long. And you would see your friends dropping off one by one by one. You know, but again, I felt like well, people are counting on me. A lot of people have invested in me. I really, I can't let these people down. I can't be a quitter. So, you know, I persevered like you were all doing right now. And I did get through it and graduated and became a freelance court reporter. And I was so happy to be able to quit my job at you know, Morton Hospital. I loved working there. It was a great job while I was in school. But like you, I was looking forward to my new career. Well, I didn't realize that when you become a court reporter, it takes a while to kind of build up. You're a freelancer. You work for yourself. So it takes kind of a while to build up your portfolio of billing. So I had to go back out and get another job. Uh, so I again worked two jobs until I could start making enough money to just work finally one job. So finally, by the time I was about 26 years old, I only had to work one job. And during this time, I had met my future husband. Uh, and so we, uh, for, for several years, while I was in college, um, he, he was working. He's an engineer. He, we lived on our big 40-foot old, old, old wooden boat in Dighton. And uh, you want to try doing that in this weather. Now, now that's, that's quite an experience. But we saved you know, a ton of money doing that. Um, you know, the, the rent is real cheap. So um, that, that was a great experience, too, even though it was very cold. You'd be out there in the winter you know, picking the ice around the boat so it didn't freeze the boat and make the boat rise up. So there was a lot of, um, you know, you know, a lot of tough stuff associated with that. But you know what? They are experiences I wouldn't trade for the world. So I have actually now been married to my husband, Ted, for 22 years. And we have two uh, teenage daughters, 14 and 17. No, 15 and 17. They, they both just had birthdays. And you know, I can see all the moms out there praying for me. <laughs> yeah. um, but, but we're very blessed. You know what? They're, they're great kids. They excel. And, um, Actually, one of them is, well, they're both on a um, uh, air rifle team. That's their sport, uh, which is kind of a unique sport for girls. And one of them is going to Colorado this coming weekend to compete. So they're trying right now to qualify for the Junior Olympics, which we're very excited about. And they have qualified for before and competed in before. Um, but, you know, it's nice to see my girls and any girls. We have a, a lot of girls on our team, and the girls are um, oftentimes better than the boys. Uh, so so they're, they're really disciplined, but it's a great sport for girls. So when my kids were little, um, I worked part-time. I started working part-time and was really heavily involved in their school, you know, preschool, first grade, second grade, third grade. Uh, because I loved volunteering, loved doing that kind of stuff. Really heavily involved in our church. Uh, started uh, teaching Sunday school and then eventually started uh, running the Sunday school, being the superintendent of the Sunday school. And I loved doing that. Every Sunday I would really look forward to that because it was so fun being with the kids and doing our lessons. And we would have some really interactive stuff. And the kids really enjoyed it too because I wanted to make it so that we didn't just sit there and talk about the Bible, but we did fun stuff with food and games and plays and role playing. So, you know, that was a, a really big part of our lives at the time. So I was pretty busy. You know, I, I was a full-time mom. I worked part-time. 
volunteered uh, at school and at church, and was really enjoying just my family and being a mom. You know, it's the best feeling in the world. The most important job you will ever have in your life is being a parent. And so this is actually, being a mom, is actually what led me into politics, which is a little bit unique too, I think, because oftentimes being a mom keeps you from doing stuff because you wanna concentrate on your kids and your family and you don't have time for other things. So at this time, and this, we're, we're fast forwarding now to about 2008, uh, this was a time when Jessica's Law was kind of sweeping the country. Now, Jessica's Law was mandatory sentencing for sex offenders, uh, repeat violent sex offenders. And it was called Jessica's Law because a young girl named Jessica Lonsford, who I believe was about 10 years old, uh, several years before, had been abducted from her um, mobile home in Florida, brought next door, and was really um, brutalized, it's an awful story, and killed by a repeat sex offender who really should have been in jail. So that really um, started this uh, move to protect children, um, which is what we all want to do, protect children. So keep, you know, repeat sex offenders in jail for a long time so that they, they can't harm children. And a lot of states passed it. I mean, it passed in, in, you know, more than half the country. Massachusetts had been trying to pass it for several years. Yeah, sure, do you have a question? Oh, it, it is absolutely child abuse. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so, so different states have different laws, and uh, that um, particular crime did involve murder. So I think in Florida, I'm not sure if Florida has capital punishment or not. I believe it does. So he could have gotten that whether he did or not, but. Yeah, so, so yeah, so some states do. I, you know, I think about 30 states do have the death penalty. Um, however, if, if the child isn't, murdered, obviously, that, that would not apply. Um, but, but here in Massachusetts, we struggled just to get a law passed to make sentencing a lot tougher for um, these you know, child abusers. So we had, you know, Jessica, uh, the story of Jessica Lunsford, and then right here in Massachusetts, uh, shortly, uh, right around that time frame, uh, there was another story that came out of a little boy in a library being abused right there in the library by, a, again, a repeat sex offender that should have been in jail. And as a mom with young kids, this weighed on me heavily. You know, I thought about it constantly. And I just thought, you know, what can I do? I have got to do something. Because I think a lot of times we sit here and we say, why isn't somebody doing something about this, right? And finally I said, you know what? That's not helping anymore, so I'm gonna be that person that does something about it. And once I, I made that decision to, to figure out how to get involved, I really felt this weight lifted off my shoulder, like, you know, I am gonna be um, able to help kids, to protect my own kids. So I got involved, and I didn't know how to, because I had never got involved in anything like this before. I was not involved in politics at all. I mean, I, I voted, you know, I paid attention, but that was about it. So I found a group, an advocacy group called Community Voices, and I called them up and I, I said, listen, I want to help, I want to do something, how can I get involved? And they signed me right up. 
Um, so, so I joined that group and, you know, locally in our community, I just I started really trying to educate people on what the problem was and how we were trying to get this law passed in Massachusetts and the fact that we were really struggling to get it passed in Massachusetts. And I went to every uh, fair and community event with all my literature and would talk to people and pass it out and really try to get them on board. Um, it also led me to go to the State House for the first time ever and testify in front of the committee where this bill was. And boy, that was a very scary experience because I had never done anything like that either. You know, and I was shaking, um, but I did it. You know, I made myself do it. And it also required me to meet with my own state representative here in Taunton at that time to ask for his support on this bill. And I was scared to do that too because, you know, I had never done anything like that and you're thinking this is big powerful person and it's a little bit intimidating. But, you know, these were things I just pushed myself to do and I, I met and went and met with uh, him. You know, and unfortunately he didn't really support the bill so I, w I was really disappointed about that. But I didn't let that um, discourage me. I went on to do what I was going to do anyway and advocate for it. And this also brought me in touch with Karen Polito, who is currently our Lieutenant Governor, uh, because she was really spearheading this movement at that time. Um, so I met a lot of great people. And finally, we ended up getting a bill passed in about 2009. Wasn't the exact bill we wanted, wasn't as tough as I would have liked it to have been, but it was, a, it was a step forward, it was a start in protecting our children. And I think I kind of went into this, you know, with blinders on, a little bit naive, because I thought, who wouldn't want to pass a bill like this? Why wouldn't you do this to protect children? To me, it was common sense. But that's not the way it works in politics. You know, common sense doesn't always prevail. Um, so, so it was a real eye-opener to see how difficult it was to get this done. And so after that, you know, I thought a lot about our representation and didn't feel, you know, or let me put it the other way, uh, felt like we deserved more representation or maybe a different kind of representation. And this was also at a time where in our state legislature, there were some, you know, some political scandals going on. Uh, there were speakers of the House that were in, indicted for, for different you know, things. And, and that's a small portion. I mean, most of the people at the State House are just great, great people, and they are very dedicated. But again, I thought, you know, we deserve a better government than this. We deserve better representation. And what can I do about this? So now I guess I kind of had the fever. So I thought, you know, I talked with my husband about it and, you know, we were pretty frustrated about how things went. And, you know, I said, why don't I run for state representative? And he's like, yeah, yeah, I think we should do it. So we decided to do that in um, probably late 2009 or so. Now, we had no idea how to run for an office. I had never run for anything in my life before. Um, well, I ran for actually seventh grade student council, and that was about it. And I lost that one. So, <laughs> but, um, so we, we went out again and just found some information, how do we get involved, and started telling people that I'm gonna run for office. And we put our little grassroots team together. And I know you probably hear that word a lot, grassroots, but I'll tell you, this was the grassroots. You know, just a bunch of us who had never been involved, getting together, figuring it out. And then, you know, you had to start telling people that you were running for this office. And that's a scary thing to do, too. And so I would tell people, you know, look, I'm running for state representative. I'd appreciate your support. And they'd be like, oh, that's wonderful, who you're running against. And I'd tell them, and they'd say, oh, <laughs> well, you know, that's great, but you're never going to win. But it'll be a good experience. And, and that was just my family. Um, but... <laughs> But you had to get used to that too. So it, it, it's really hard to run against somebody who's an incumbent, who's been there for a very long time, who's probably done a lot of really great things for different people in the community. Um, so, you know, we put our grassroots team together. I had to, again, really push myself to do things that I had never done before. Uh, there were a lot of obstacles. And I'll tell you, one thing that always weighed 
heavily on my mind throughout my whole time that I ran for office the first time was the fact that I had quit high school and I had my GED. And unfortunately, I was, I was like ashamed of that. I was afraid that people would find out and would use it against me. And it was a real fear I had all the time. And, and people actually did um, throw that out there and try to use it against me, say that I was a high school dropout. So I had to deal with that a little bit. Um, but it, it really opened my eyes. And I thought, you know what? I really shouldn't look at this and be ashamed of it. I should look at this and be proud of it, right? Proud of where I was, how I you know, tried to better myself, and that I was moving on in life, and that I had gone back to school and gone back to college. So it, it took me a long time to kind of get over that and be more open about the fact that I had my GED. Um, but I've got to applaud every single person here in this room. Um, I, I'm real proud of you, and I think it's great that you're here. So some of the other obstacles, though, were you, know, you had to go and knock on people's doors. Um, and you know, try knocking on a stranger's door and just saying, hey, I'm running for office, will you vote for me? That's a really hard thing to do, a really scary thing to do. But believe it or not, most people were either like, okay, thanks, or they would be very interested. Very few people were, were rude or, or slammed the door in our face or anything like that. Uh, the other huge obstacle I faced was speaking in public. You know, that when they say that people fear speaking in public more than death, I believe it <laughs> because, you know, that is a real, yeah, that's a tough thing to do. So I, I'll tell you, the more experience you can get at doing that, you know, take it when you can get it because if you ever have to do it, you know, in front of cameras or in front of people or in a debate, it's, um, it's hard to learn on the fly. Uh, so, but, you know, again, I, I just, I pushed myself and pushed myself. I did all these difficult things that I did not want to do. Um, and something, you know, always stuck in my mind. So in church, my pastor would, you know, give the sermon, and, and sometimes I would write down some of the things he said and just post them on my wall in my office for a little inspiration when I needed it. And, you know, one day he said, God calls on us to do things that we don't always want to do and that we think we can't do. But he gives us the tools we need. And so I always had that on my wall, and I would read it all the time because, again, I just wanted to quit. You know, you're at a point, you're like, why am I even doing this to myself and my family? Because it's a lot of time away from your family, and my kids were fairly little. But, you know, we dragged them with us everywhere all the time, and people actually liked that. And they had a lot of fun, too. Um, but again, you know, I just wanted to walk away, but I couldn't. A lot of people had invested their time and their effort in me. A lot of people were counting on me. And there was no way that I could just walk away and say, sorry. I mean, obviously, I could have if I wanted to, and people would have understood. But uh, it just wasn't in me. I, I just couldn't do that to other people. Um, so you know, we trudged on. And I did have to do two debates, and those were really scary. I, I remember driving to one of the debates thinking, oh, if I got into an accident right now, I'd be so <laughs> happy because I wouldn't have to go to the debate. <laughs> you know, but, but, but I made it through. I made it through. And um, so election night came. And you know, by the end of the campaign, I was like, boy, I really feel like we can win this thing. I, I, there was just this feeling in the community, this feeling in the air. And most people wrote me off, thought I did not have a chance in the world to win this thing. And when all was said and done, we ended up winning um, against a very uh, long time incumbent who was well funded, well spoken, great guy, by 31 votes on election night. And that was a feeling I will never, ever forget when my husband told me that we won. Um, and our whole team was there. And you know, for, for all the, the work, all the challenges, all the time away from my family, everything that it took for us to do this, I, I will always cherish that time because 
it made me a stronger person, it made me a better person, and it really made me look deep inside myself at who I am and what I stand for and why am I doing this. So obviously after that, I had to get to work. Um, so I was a newcomer to politics. People didn't know who I was. Um, uh, you know, obviously enough people knew, you know, to, to get me in there, but just by the skin of my teeth. And, you know, people were kind of nervous about what kind of representative I would be. Would I still support all the same things that they were used to being supported? So I got to work, and I think that I kind of brought something to politics that that people really connected with. I worked so hard, and I, I had to, you know, I, I had to prove to people that I was going to do a good job for them. So I worked so hard. I went to every, you know, human services organization, social services, I, any event in Taunton I went to, I was deeply, deeply involved in the community, volunteering on boards, as was my whole family, which I think really made a difference for, for people too. They liked that family unit. <coughs> and I held regular office hours, which was something people I don't think had ever had, where people could come to me every week with their problems, instead of just emailing me or calling me, and sit down and talk to me. And I'll tell you, over the nine years in, in office, we've been able to help thousands of people with um, problems you know, that just run the whole spectrum, whether it be needing help with health care or housing or they're losing their house and they need help with their mortgage or they need help with getting, you know, SNAP assistance or heating assistance, just businesses, um, all sorts of different issues. And for me, that has been the absolute most rewarding part of my job and the best part of my job. So our first re-election came and that was a really tough one um, because I had only been in office two years. And, um, you know, I was an outsider from politics. And I think that was actually something that helped me a lot in my career, was not kind of coming in with these preconceived notions of this is how it is and this is what you're supposed to do and this is what you're not supposed to do. Um, you know, I really wanted to do what was right for the people, regardless of who was leaning on me not to do it. So being totally disconnected from, you know, insider politics was helpful to me. So our first re-election was a really tough one. I really didn't know if we were going to win or not, but we ended up winning by 54% of the vote. So we really made up um, a lot of those votes. And it was a good feeling because I felt, okay, we're doing the right thing. People are liking what I'm standing for. And they're seeing a different style of politics. And they're seeing another side of the story. You know, they had always just seen this side. And now they were seeing the other side. And they liked what they saw. And so um, I, I then had three more re-elections after that, and each time we increased our margin until, you know, my, my last re-election was about, I think, 62% of the vote or something like that. And, you know, and I'm not telling you that to brag, but just to let you know that, you know, as an outsider coming from politics, someone that people thought would fall flat on their face when they got in there because I was not from the political world, we were really able to do our own thing, be my own person, and make that up. And coming from Taunton, which is a really blue-collar, Democrat community, um, it was an even greater feat because I wasn't supposed to be there. And I was there and was able to, you know, be successful and, and help people. Um, so building that trusting relationship in the community has been something that's been very important to me and that I've always worked very hard on. So I served five terms in the legislature, and this was my ninth year in the legislature, my fifth term. And so I just ran for mayor of Taunton and won that seat by 63, with 63% 63 of the vote, which we were, were really um, humbled by. 
and have become the first woman mayor for the city of Taunton, uh, for my hometown. So, uh, thank you, thank you. Um, and I just, I can't tell you how much it means to me and how honored and humbled I am to be where I am today. You know, to think about how I grew up, the struggles we faced, where I came from, the trajectory of my life, quitting school, not knowing if I would ever amount to anything, <coughs> people not having those <coughs> high expectations, and being given so much opportunity by this community um, to do what I want to do, um, to be who I want to be, to achieve what I want to set out to achieve. And I, I hope that I can be you know, a, a role model and an inspiration for other women and young women to let them know that no matter where you are in life, no matter what your circumstance or where you come from, you can achieve your dreams and goals. And there are people out there that care about you and that will help you to do that. Um, one of the things that I've also done is mentor high school students. There's a great program in Taunton, it's called the Taunton Area School to Career Program. And it matches you up with students. And it's a really great program because they'll ask you about your life and your interests and match you up with a student that you know is kind of in the same situation that you've been in in life. And you go to different colleges, BCC hosts the task program, and we tour colleges and different businesses. And these are kids who maybe they're, no one in their family has ever gone to college, maybe they're facing you know, struggles financially or emotionally, and you really get to know them and mentor them. We, we go out to lunch and take them to different businesses, help them with their resume. So it's really kind of helping them find the path for them in life at this really critical time when they need that, that extra help from outside of their family. So that's been a great program. So being mayor, you know, I feel like, well, it's a big responsibility no matter what. Um, I think being the first woman mayor is a really big responsibility. I feel like there's a very bright light shining on me and I'm glad for that. I feel like there's a lot, um, a lot of expectation, and I'm glad for that. And I want to be successful, not for myself, but I want to be successful for my community and for all women out there um, to be an example of what people can achieve when they put their mind to it, when they work hard, and when they believe in themselves. Um, so, so that's pretty much my life story, uh, in a nutshell, I guess. And I've never really shared this, this whole story with anyone before, so thank you for, for being here and being so kind and listening to me. And um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. One, one other thing I just, uh, let me go back, I wanted to touch on is, um, you know, I talked a lot about how having a GED and I was really nervous about that and I felt like I had to hide that. Well, you know, after I got elected, I actually ended up coming and, and starting to visit the GED classes that um, BCC um, runs because I wanted to share my story with them. I wanted to know that I've been in that place and that they're doing some really great things and can achieve. So. I had to make the decision to you know, not hide these things from people and, and be proud of it and move forward. And I was very honored uh, when BCC asked me to be their keynote speaker at one of the graduations for the HiSET program. That was, that was several years ago. And I was able to share my story with them too. Uh, so, so I've finally gotten over that and um, am pursuing, like you guys, uh, some more classes at BCC. Um, which I'll hopefully be signing up for again <laughs> soon for the summer. Um, so, so anyway, thank you all very much. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, thankful for what you're doing in your lives to better yourselves and help your yourselves and your families. Uh, thank you.
say, because the mic is here, that we'll repeat your question in the front. Oh, okay. So everyone hears it. Huh. Okay. Honey. Small world. Yeah, it is. All right. But um, that's why I originally had met you, and um, I always thought very highly of you for devoting your time to your staff. Are you still doing that? Oh, thank you. Actually, I did it for five. So uh, this gentleman just talked about the mentor program that I was speaking of, and that's where we met. And we also grew up near each other uh, and asked if I was still doing the mentor program. So I did it for five years and then I, I took a year off because uh, last year I actually, I ended up having several surgeries on my shoulder, my neck. I'm good though, 100% back. Uh, but it was a really tough year for me um, the year before and so in this year I was, you know, quite busy running for office. So I, I haven't done it in the past couple of years, but I do hope to get back to it again because it is something I really enjoyed. And thank you for, yeah. Oh, fantastic. Oh, thank you, thank you. I, I do hope to, to be able to make a difference, a, a bigger difference here in time. Yes. Um, can you elaborate a little bit more on the uh, task program? Oh, sure. So the question was, can I elaborate more on the task program? So it's called Taunt Area School to Career Program, and it was started by Don Cleary, who was a superintendent of schools and is actually now the interim mayor until I'm sworn in in January. And so they take, um, usually it's about, I think, 70 kids. Uh, 50 to 70 kids, and they're at the different high schools, so it can be BP, Taunton High, uh, and Bristol Aggie, and they can be either in a junior year or senior year, and it's a program where they, they really teach them things, um, how to succeed in life, how to move forward, things like uh, dress for success, like Eva just talked about. There's a dress for success program. How do I dress for an interview? You know, when you're 17, you might think that ripped jeans and, you know, a, a leather jacket are okay for an interview, but they might not be fit the interview you're going to. So we teach them how to dress for an interview, how to do a resume, um, how to kind of conduct themselves in an interview bring them to colleges to introduce them. Maybe they don't really think that they're college material or have never visited a college. Introduce them to all these opportunities that they'll have in life. Uh, introduce them to the trades as well because maybe they're not on the college track but they want to go right into a trade. So it's really exposing kids to all the opportunities that are available to them and also helping them if at that time they need help in finding a job while they're still in high school. And I actually still keep in touch with a couple of the um, the uh, mentees that I had, and one uh, this year is graduating from college. I just saw her mother the other day. So I was really thrilled to hear about that. So it really is a successful program for a lot of kids in high school. And they're always looking for mentors. <laughs> you don't have to be you know, a professional. Anybody can be a mentor. You just have to have a little bit of time during the day here and there. It's not a huge time commitment, but um, some time to mentor them. So if anybody's interested, I'd love to get them the information. Yes, ma'am. Um, I know you said you're focused on the 15 to 17, and you said in the fourth you're going to end up in the How did you balance the political world and motherhood? Yeah, that's a great question. How did I balance the political world and motherhood when I first began? And so, so the first year, it was challenging because I, I really just dove deep into my work and into the community. 
But one of the great things about that job was I could bring my family with me to all sorts of different things, all sorts of different events. You know, we would volunteer at the pancake breakfast for the veterans on Veterans Day, and we would have a card table to send over to the troops. So my kids would help me with those things. Um, they would come to a lot of different events, um, a lot of events for our veterans, too. Um, I, I love working with our veterans. We have a great group of veterans here in Taunton. And so how I handled it a lot was I involved my family in my work. And it was my kids, I think, learned a lot from that and um, are a little better educated about how things uh, work in, in politics, maybe more educated than they want to be. Uh, but but that was a balancing act and I'm very lucky I have a really supportive family I have two mothers-in-law I have my mom you know my dad and people helped us uh, a lot at that time with our kids and I would just always tell people you know don't come to my house without an appointment <laughs> but, but my mom was great she would always she would actually come over and help me with my housework and you know clothing you know laundry and stuff like that so um, it was a balance, and my husband is really great too, uh, really picked up a lot of the slack. So um, it was just a balancing act and I had a lot of help and my family is pretty, you know, close and tight knit and we just did a lot of the stuff together. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, sure, sure. Yes, so it's a great question because we actually just put our uh, transition team together and our first meeting is tonight as a matter of fact. And so what we've done is take uh, different categories that you know are important. We couldn't fit every category, but a lot of different categories. So uh, one is business development. Um, revitalizing our neighborhoods, you know, environment and energy, um, human services and social services, mental health and substance use. And so we've invited a lot of wonderful people in from the community who are volunteering to be on this transition team and really work on all these individual issues with us um, because they have expertise, experience, um, education in these different areas so that we can look at how do we make improvements on what we have right now. So we really want to hit all those important areas as soon as we get in the door. I mean, we're actually already working on it right now. But improving the, you know, the quality of life for people is, is really our focus and our main goal. And it is a broad question, and you do that in so many different ways um, by revitalizing our downtown and our neighborhoods, by you know creating an environment in which people can find jobs when they graduate from college, um, where people have opportunity, by ensuring that we have services available uh, for people who struggle with m mental health issues or substance use issues, and that we're getting them the help that they need, and I think. You know, being in the legislature for nine years has really given me a lot of knowledge on how to access um, resources to help people. One thing that we have helped people a lot with is substance use and getting them into treatment. And I know that's a big issue in, in many communities. It's an issue in Taunton that we've worked very hard on. We have the Taunton Opiate Task Force and working very closely with them some folks from there are on our transition team to see what what services we can fill in how can we do a better job um, that task force does an excellent job right now and they really they um, make it very personal and try to make those connections with people who need them there uh, there they go after uh, looking for how to provide services to people that need it, rather than waiting for people to come to them. So, so we'll be working on all of those areas, uh, just to, you know, in general, uh, 
improve the quality of life for all people in Taunton, in, in, move Taunton to a leading city status here in the Commonwealth. This city is a great city, has so much potential, and I know that we can achieve great things. Yeah. <laughs> Sure. So there is someone from Taunton State Hospital on our transition team. So you, you're, and, and she said, why can't we um, utilize Taunton State Hospital more for services? Uh, Taunton State Hospital right now does provide a lot of services. So they have a woman's program. It's called the RAP program, W-R-A-P, RAP program. And that is an all women's program that provides uh, treatment for substance use and mental health issues. And uh, I believe there's 40 or 45 beds in that program. It's an inpatient program. And I've, I've visited there several times. I'm actually on the human services, uh, human rights committee there for that program at Taunton State Hospital. Um, so I, I think you're right on the money. We need to look at what we have available. Taunton State is a great resource. I'm sorry? Oh, okay. Right, yeah. And you know, the, the at the state level, so that's who provides the beds and the and the resources. Uh, those resources have increased uh, every year over the last several years. Uh, they're not where they should be. It's always important to provide more services, and that's always our goal is to provide as much service as we can to people and explore <coughs> the uses of Taunton State Hospital too. Oh, I see another question. Can you speak more on what you do for veterans? Uh, sure, sure. So in Taunton, we have uh, a lot of veterans groups, the Taunton Area Vietnam Veterans Association, the DAV, Disabled American Veterans, and, and others. And I've always been very involved with them uh, in not only in, you know, events that they have. So, for instance, the Taunton Area Vietnam's Veteran Association always holds a POW MIA ceremony because one thing that is extremely important to them is that we never forget our POWs and MIAs who have not yet come home, no matter what war they're from. Uh, so I always support them in that, support funding for that, and that's very, very important to them. We do that twice a year. And also to educate people about why that's important. I've worked with our veterans uh, at the state level. There was a problem with um, veterans' remains being properly buried because maybe they didn't have family or whatever the case was. So we worked with the you know, um, funeral directors, with uh, other departments that were involved in that to ensure that uh, veterans' remains got the uh, proper honors that they should have when you know, they pass. Um, we worked with them on ensuring that there was uh, a POW flag in all of our communities. So, so things like that, you know, that are important to them, um, I'm always willing to listen. And I'm an auxiliary member of the Taunton Area Vietnam Veterans Association, too. Yes, ma'am. So, so the question was, um, do I help people with intellectual disabilities to get services? And sure, if uh, anyone comes to our office, and, and we always encourage people to call as, as the state rep, because a lot of times people don't think of it, and we can often, we can't always solve your problem, but we try our best, 
and we can oftentimes connect people to services that they need and we will make those phone calls and make those connections. They have really great programs here in Taunton. Uh, Co-op has a program, Pride Inc. has a program, The Arc has a program. So Taunton really has a lot of services right here in our community and we would always work to connect people to those services or whatever it is that they might need. So, all right. All right, great. Well, listen, thank you all so much for your fantastic questions and for being here today and um, for everything that you're doing in our community, too. Thank you. Thank you.